This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com with none other than three-time world champion, WWE Hall of Famer, winner of many other championships. He's been in AWA, WWE, WCW, Florida Championship Wrestling, none other than the founder of DDP Yoga, Diamond Dallas Page, who's about to go to England. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I guess maybe about a week away, but I'm trying to get, get everything together to go away for two and a half weeks uh, and get all the PR in and everything too. You know, it, uh, it, it, it always comes up too fast. And the one thing I hate, I don't know how you feel about it, but I hate packing, you know, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. I guess your wife doesn't do the packing for you. That, that could be an advantage of being married sometimes. Uh, well, you know, actually we share it, but uh, it's still, cause I bring, I, I bring everything. Like, like you can't believe it. Like I'm bringing pillows and I'll even bring a blanket. I, it's ridiculous how much, how much shit I bring with me on the road, but you know, then I have all the conveniences of home and that's, that's the biggest thing. So what exactly are you doing over there in the UK for any of the fans that might be watching from over there? Oh, well, you know, this is a time of year when, uh, for starters, uh, for, uh, for the love of wrestling, they're the original guys that are bringing me out there. Uh, and they hooked me up big time, fly me first class and everything, because I just won't go. I, I leave me, you ain't fly me first class, I'm not going anywhere. But they, they were super cool. They got that. I got to get my wife to go too. And so we'll be there, I believe, on the 29th and 30th in, uh, in um, Manchester, where we'll actually fly into. And then I've got time. We're going to fly in early because I want to, you know, tour around some DDP yoga. So uh, we'll be up in. Uh, First stop, we're going to go when we first get there is up into the mountains because Paige loves to climb mountains. And um, so there's some so there's some pretty decent ones up there in, uh, up in Scotland. And then we're going to do our first stop will be Glasgow. We're doing a workshop in Glasgow on a, a Saturday of the 17th. I'm not even sure exact date, but whatever the week of the 17th is, I think it's a 21st or 22nd. Uh, and then the next day we'll be in Newcastle and then we've got a couple of days off and then we'll end up for the love of wrestling on the 29th and 30th, <clears throat> a couple more days off. And then on Wednesday, the fourth, we'll be doing Birmingham and that one, poof, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people at all of them. Um, but I want to give people one last chance to go to DDP yoga workshops, like DDP yoga workshop with an S workshops.com and they can get their uh, admission. We'll also be doing it at the door as well, but it's always easier when you do it up front and get it done. It's already out there, but uh, you know, we've got over 150 people coming in Birmingham and every single person Hannibal, when they walk in, my wife and I are, are waiting to greet them and get a picture with them. Of course, a lot of people who come have a story to tell. You know, and that's that's the main reason that I do this because, you know, I'm pretty much at this point, you know, going to stay home. <laughs> I don't have to do any signings. I don't have to do anything. You know, it took eight years to be an overnight success with DDP Yoga, but I don't have to go anywhere anymore. But I still stay active because I want to get and meet the people. And a lot of them just want to tell me their story and what they went through and, uh, it sometimes it gets pretty emotional uh, because it's pretty heavy, you know. Uh, but uh, take a picture with everybody uh, as they come in, and then we work our way to the stage. And I do like inspiration means perspiration. The first part of it's about people, pe you know, picking people up, you know, and giving them that uh, hope for a lot of people who come, and then other people who want to get better at the program and feel better and younger and. You know, uh, you, you know, you've done it, <laughs> you know, help them eliminate their pains. And then I get into the diamond dozen, which anyone can do, as you know, because again, you've done it. Um, so I, I break it down. So I show everybody all the modifications. And when we get done with that part, then I'll start an actual workout. But for some people, that is a workout. So a lot of people, you know, not a lot, but a, you know, some people will sit on the on the on the mat and watch what happens after that. 
the really cool part is just about all of them will get up at some point and do what they can do. And that's the biggest thing that I preach with my program. Make it your own. Make the DDPY your own. And, you know, at some point, it'll meet you exactly where you are and help to more than anything that I think the number one thing is build confidence. A lot of people lose their confidence and this helps to really build confidence because you're the one putting the work in. Yeah. And the one thing I like about it, which by the way, at one point in time, many years ago, I was skeptical about it, but I've said many times on my channel that, uh, you, it's definitely works and it's real. And I understand now how this has helped so many people because it actually is better than a chiropractor. If you do it regularly, you don't need to do a, a chiropractor or anything. But but it's it's good that you don't do everything perfectly. Some of the moves you can't get. So it it makes it feel like you're one of us when we're trying to do it along with you. You know, it's really interesting because in the beginning, when Kimberly, my first wife, had introduced yoga to me, you know, I think me and you would have been the poster boys for guys who wouldn't be caught dead doing yoga. You know, because <laughs> so, I was more than skeptical and I didn't want to do it. But she kind of bullied me into it because I'll try anything to help my body feel better. I'll try anything to hold back the hands of time. And her whole comeback to me was like, you just signed that multi-million dollar three-year deal. If you don't get back in the ring in six months, that contract goes bye-bye. And it wasn't for the money as much as it was for being able to continue to hold on to the dream and keep getting in that ring. And because there's there, there's no drug that is equivalent to someone chanting your name, you know, especially in something they know is predetermined. Like you've gotten to connect with them and as, as a character that much, um, it, you know, is is amazing. So she eventually got me to try it, and everybody was like Gumby, and they could twist themselves up in pretzels, and she could do all that shit. I couldn't know, and. Uh, Long story short, you know, at, at some point I figured out the modifications, you know, so, okay, how can I do this, but not be where they are, but where I am. And that's why I do encourage people, you know, and sometimes I'll fall, you know, it's like, I, I stumble and I laugh at it, you know, because it's part of, it, it's part of life, you know, we all, we all know this, but most people don't really pay attention to it. We have to fail to be successful at everything. Unless you're just one of those freaks who picks up a baseball bat and hits it on his first swing. <laughs> you know, if not, he's going to swing and miss, <laughs> you know, and eventually, you know, you get to hit the ball if you work at it hard enough. <laughs> Yeah, and the other thing I notice is you're a great coach, even though it's an app, it it almost feels like you're right there in person. And a lot of them are the live workouts that you are doing with, with a group of people there, but not only you, but I don't know if Steven Richards still does it, but there's some good uh, workouts with him on there as well. Yep, Stevie, uh, you know, he, he was a zealot for me in the beginning because – you know, he was literally doing it at independent shows. I haven't talked to him in a while, uh, but I'm, I'm sure he's still doing it, you know, because it's kind of what keep, if you stop doing it, it becomes, you become the tin man and you lose your mobility and the pain comes back. It's kind of like brushing your teeth. You know, you, you got to brush your teeth every day, you know, or your teeth are going to fall out, right? Yeah. And I recently watched an interview with the Ultimate Warrior, and I was surprised to say that you were one of the guys that inspired him to come back to WCW in the late '90s. Did he ever tell you that, dude? That's a moment. I, I, I didn't know that he actually openly talked about that. But one, you know, now yeah, you got to remember. Let's go back to him and Hogan 
WrestleMania six, right? They're the main event. Hulk's going to do the job, the warrior, the passing of the torch. I'm driving the pink Cadillac rhythm and blues. And I got that gig because guys like, check this picture out here. Jake was the first guy to come in my club. That I had in Fort Myers, Florida. And if you worked Miami and uh, then Tampa or Tampa and Miami, that's 300 miles. But right around the middle is Fort Myers. Jake came in one night. We got so fucked up. We had such a good time. He, that was the beginning of me getting to know Jake. And it's really kind of funny because, you know, in the beginning, I walk up to him and go, hey, man, you Jake the Snake Roberts? Who wants to know? I said, the guy who, who runs this place, yes, what can I do for you? What are we drinking? So it opens with me and him getting fucked up. And then later, this ends up happening. <laughs> you know, the resurrection of Jake. And he gets sober. He's been sober for 10 years now. But back then, he told all the boys. So these two guys end up in the club. <laughs> and it was funny uh, thank you baby uh, it was funny because uh, Luke uh, who just lost his partner Butch which was a you know, sad moment you know, for, but for, for Lukey man uh, those guys have both been in my club uh, but Luke and I have stayed really close over the years and he put that picture up on his Facebook and it said DDP before he was DDP. <laughs> um, but they, you know, they all, you know, ca came into the club. So that's what got me like thinking about wrestling again and uh, imagining it happening and, you know, coming up with the manager idea and all that shit. Because I thought at 31, I was too old to wrestle, you know. So, so as far as the warrior, oh wait, he actually wait, told you that in person I, as well. I knew there was something I was trying to get at. So, I turn, you know, I go from driving the pink Cadillac to now it's eight years later, and Warriors coming in to work with Hogan, and I'm going for the world title with Goldberg. So. He's come in. We're going to be double billed in the main event. And the day that Warrior gets there, he lit. It was, I don't remember where we were, but we had to take golf carts. So someone come and gets me. Someone come and gets Goldberg. And we drive to where Warrior's locker room is. And when he opens the door, hey, he gave us both hugs. You know, and he was like, you two guys are the reason why I'm back. He said, you guys are having so much fun out there. He's like, I got to be a part of that. And that was like really cool to hear from, you know, that cat, you know what I mean? That me and Goldie freaking influenced him freaking coming back. Yeah, you too. And he also put over Macho Man, but there was only a handful of wrestlers that he actually spoke highly of. And, and you were in there. But as far as Goldberg, we, we always hear from Bret Hart uh, that, that he was careless in the ring and stuff, but we hear from other people that he was actually great in the ring. How was your experience with Goldberg? Yeah, you got you to gotta realize where me and Goldie started at. Like, I met him at a strip joint <laughs> in the Gold Club, like probably four years before he ever came in. And I like, that's so he had a full head of hair, you know, because he never had to shave his head. He did it because he wanted something different. And it wasn't to, you know, to mimic, you know, Stone Cold. He just thought he looked, it was a personality that he was taking on. Um, but, uh, you know, I knew him from trying to get him to get in then. And then later, when his football career was over, it was Sting and Luger who brought him to meet Bischoff. And then from there, took on his own deal. But I'd go down to power plant and I'd work with, 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 uh, uh, I always call him Goldie, uh, you know, Bill. Um, so I had worked with him, like teaching him stuff and just like, you know, people had taught me. And so we had a really good working relation, uh, relationship. And 
I know that it wasn't Bret Hart's thing because he was just such a master technician to actually get in the ring and you know walk through stuff. You know, pretty much. Okay, we'll do this, this, and that, and we'll call the rest out there because he's from that generation. What's fascinating is that I took Bill, you know, and we both went to the power plant. And I told him, you're going to miss the first spear. And by this time, he's Bill Goldberg. Like, he knows he's the man, you know. Uh, even though he'd only been working like a year and two months. And he goes, no, I'm not. I said, yeah, you got to trust me on this one. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna miss the spear. And he's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and that went on for a couple of weeks. And when we got there, when I showed him how he was going to miss it, he got it. And he did it with me. But if you go back and watch that spot, I kick him and he you know, drops back. He's going to spear me in the corner to turnbuckle. He did not want to miss me. If you look at it, man, I literally get my feet up and over as he's going through a milliliter of a second later, he's going to spear me. And he hit his shoulder big time. And then when he finally did spear me, he, he knocked himself out because I knew he could, when he came with that spear, he was coming. So I'm going to be gone. Like you're coming at me. I'm gone. And uh, so it was like hitting a napkin. You know, imagine hitting a napkin with the fierce that Goldberg came through. His head hit first and knocked himself out. He was unconscious until we got back. He was on completely, you know, I've done it before, been knocked out and walk, woke up walking backstage and looking at Kimberly and I just wrestle. So I know what that's like because I've been there. But um, for me, he was snug as, as could be because to Bill, it was real. You know, anything who was out there, like if it didn't look real, Bill wasn't doing it. And when he came with it, he came strong. I don't think he never meant to hurt Bret Hart ever in a billion years. You know, you know I love Bret. I loved working with him. I had some great matches with him. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's, I understandably so, because, you know, if someone really catches you, you know, with something, you're going to, you're going to hold on to that being bitter about it, you know, and, you know, it, it, I, it didn't happen to me. So I know it happened to Brett, though, and, and, it, and it screwed him up, you know, uh, as far as the concussions and all that. And so many of us have had so many concussions. Like, the crazy thing is, like, I look at a guy like Benoit, who I loved. And I'm the one who wanted to work with him because I knew he was a main event cat. Didn't give a shit if he was 5'8 or 5'10 or whatever the hell he was. You know, to me, he was as believable as you could be. And when he died, Chris Dewinsky said that he had the uh, brain of an 87-year-old Alzheimer patient. So... A lot to be said for it is why it's why I live my life the way I do today. Like I do so many things with oxygen therapy for my brain that it's like no one's doing what I'm doing. Nobody. Because uh, yeah. I heard you talk about everything you have in your house. Could you go over like everything you have just in your house for not only your brain but for your body? Yeah, let me let me let's take a walk. And I'll show you because it's not real. You know, this is, this is the war room here where you can see a billion pictures and a billion different memories from so many different levels. This is one of my favorite pictures with me and American Dream in 1989. Here, here's, I was just talking about this. This is Ali calling the lockup. How cool is that? So as we go in here, I think my wife's done it here uh, filming. Hold on here. So this is literally the workout area where, you know, we do all our workouts and everything, you know, that we did not film at the PC, but we did during COVID and got all the title belts up there and stuff. 
and they just moved everything because we've been doing a brand new series of workouts that we're going to be doing that will be called the, 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 the things that we wear around our, our, our arms and legs are called power cuffs and their blood flow restriction. So we're, I'm back to weightlifting at, along with DDPY. I'm back to weightlifting uh, to increase, you know, muscle size. Because as you get older, I just turned 67. That's the thing you start losing is muscle size. When you lose muscle density, then you start to lose a lot. You know, people fall down. You know, they're not strong enough. My strength is at an all-time high right now. Say hello to Hannibal. Hey, how's it going, Hannibal? Love hello. your name. <laughs> Thank you. So that's why you see the dumbbells. This company right here, Nuo, these dumbbells are amazing. Uh, they just gave these uh, to me to try to see if I like them. And you can see right here, you put it at 15 pounds, picks up. You can put it at 20, 35. <laughs> you know, you can just all different levels up to 80 pounds. I'll never use that because everything I'm doing today is lightweight. Now, stuff that I'm using to also, this is called a hyperbaric chamber, okay? And what this is, this is like going, when this thing is filled up, it's like steel. And when it's filled up, it's like um, being 35 feet below sea level. And you're only breathing in 100%, you're breathing 100% oxygen, but the compression is what forces at PSI, 12 PSI means 12, 12 pounds per square inch, that it takes you the, the, the oxygen and, and seeps it like into your, into your cells, just like as if you were uh, um, forcing oxygen, not just into your, your muscle cell, your deep tissue, but up into your brain. That's what's really cool about 12 PSI. This thing right behind me is called Libo2. And it's the same type of thing, except for you're on a bike or you're on a treadmill and you've got this mask on your face like this. So like, you know, like uh, what was the character in uh, Batman? Who had that thing? Oh, from? Bane. Right, right, like that. So it's going into this uh, oxygen chamber which is 90% oxygen, and down below, where you see the line, like down here, that is anywhere from, let's say it's, let's see, 10,000 square feet. Let me see, look right here. If you look right here, you'll see, it says 10 to 10K to 22K. Can you see that? Yeah. So, I'm thought when it says K, it means 10,000 feet to 22,000 feet. I train at 22,000 feet right now, so does my wife. And what we do is we're breathing in 8% oxygen. Like right now, we're breathing in 21% um, oxygen. When you take the oxygen away, it's like mountain climbing. The higher you go, the less the oxygen is. And when you are there for like 10 minutes, when you hit the switch and it goes to this bigger part, which is 90% oxygen, Again, the oxygen goes into your deep tissue, into your, it's healing you at a cellular level, but also going up into your brain. Like my memory right now, <clears throat> it's the best it's I've maybe ever been. And that has to do with all the oxygen training. And this right here is an infrared sauna, not just a regular sauna, it's infrared. So it's going in to your body and it's actually at the same time uh, healing you as far as getting out the toxins that are in your body. And then back over here, we've got the hot and cold plunge. And this plunge, you can see one of our people right now in it. Wait, let's walk out and see Stephanie. Stephanie's one of my girls who lost like 120 pounds. And she just did a power cuff workout with Paige. You're on Hannibal right now. Hi, uh, a, little, a little cold in there. Oh, wow.
<laughs> so Paige, what is what 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 temperature is she at it's right now? It's forty-seven. I didn't want to like, you know. Well, what were you in this morning though? I was doing thirty-seven for five minutes. So thirty-seven degrees for five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and then you go into the hot tub over here. So the hot plunge and then the, the cold plunge. Stephanie's one of our champions. Yeah, yeah Stephanie's one of our champions from uh our positively unstoppable challenge from a couple of years ago. Like we do it every year, but the really crazy thing happened. Like you know, I'm 67, right? Look how freaking crazy lean I am right now. Like it's that that cold plunging is crazy, man. Like uh, it it really like it gives you energy like at a different level. Like in the beginning, I have a new series of. I guess we'll call them podcasts too, uh, coming out probably in about a month or two. And I've already got a bunch of them in the can. One with Darby, one with um, uh, Brody. I just did to uh, Anthony Gogo. Um, I did one with Chris Van Delt. Uh, that'll go on his channel because he filmed it for his stuff. And that's where I got the idea from because uh, we mix it up. We have the whole interview we do will be one. And then there'll be a smaller one that shows you working out with us and what we're actually doing. And then we get into the, it's called DDP's gauntlet. So you start with the mask and the oxygen, excuse me, you start with the cold plunge. Then you go to the mask with the oxygen. Then you go to the mat with some DDP yoga. Then we do power cuff training with the weights and with DDP yoga and then into the hot tub and finish the thing off. So it's like a cycle of things. But all of these things that I'm doing are all more than anything to um, take the inflammation out of my body along with the brain, like trying to, you know, heal the brain from all the damage I did to it. Yeah, so there is ways of reversing the concussion issues, right? Everything you're doing? Uh, well, everything that I've seen points that way. I, like, I'm not, you know, uh, uh, Chris Lewinsky, who is like the, the leader on that. But I go by memory. Like, let's, I, and, I, and I document everything for myself. Because I'm not going to tell anybody to do anything that I don't do to myself. And when it comes to the brain, you know, the, the uh, Chris would probably say, well, we're still not really sure of that. And again, you're right. But for me, how's my memory work? Every single person will get up from what they're doing to go get something, walk in another room and go, what the fuck did I walk in here for? Like every single person at every age does it. But as you get older, it happens a lot. So, I wanted to see from this, how often would that happen? Since I've been like literally journaling myself, probably for the last, probably been doing this for about six months. So uh, I would say the last two months, when I walk into a room and go, what the fuck did I walk in here for? I won't, you know, just uh, walk back and forget about it. I'll think about it and I'll think about it. And probably 60 to 70% of the time, I remember. And I feel great. I'm like, oh, my God, I did remember that. And I know I wasn't, you know. Maybe I'll remember one out of two, one out of ten times. But I wasn't going to remember six or seven out of ten. And then there's even times where I'll be walking back, and then I remember. As opposed to completely forgetting about it. And I still write down everything. You know, if it's something, a good idea or whatever, because I don't want to forget it. Because there's only so much bandwidth you know, that we have. Now I understand. And I actually watched this today that you injured yourself in WWE by doing a superplex on Bob <laughs> Holly. And that's what led to your early departure from WWE. Could you explain to us what happened there and how you recovered? Because obviously you went on to wrestle for TNA and AEW after that. Well, um, I think I, I don't know if I recovered as much as I strengthened, you know? So let's put it like this. Bob, Bobby and I, Bobby was very snug out there, <laughs> a lot like Goldberg. You know, when Bob came with it, there's a reason why they call them hardcore Holly. 
I mean, Bobby would come with it. So you had to come right back with it. And the first match we had was really, really good. Second match, I added a couple other things into it. And uh, <clears throat> I, you know, I lit him up in a turnbuckle. I didn't even touch him, barely. Shot him off. And when he got to the turnbuckle, when I came running, it was like his leg wasn't completely straightened, but he straightened it at the end. And boom, like my neck is super like, th this is as far as I can turn my neck either way. But going from side to side, that's it. This side, I get a little bit more. Here, like pretty much nothing. Then there's here and here, which, you know, limited rotation. The bottom line is I get kicked like that it like, like rocked me a little bit. So when he came in with those 20 inch arms, the clothesline me, I didn't have it. I wasn't normally I'll be gone before he ever hits me, but because it rocked me a little, when he came through, I wasn't gone. So he hit me. And when he hit me, he knocked me out. So I'm out. Yeah, as you hit, boom, now you're out on your feet, I call it. Like when you're, okay, where am I? Like, I've been here before. Like, first thing I'm looking for, is there a red light? If there's a red light, that means we're on TV and there's a time limit. If there's no red light, I say, Bobby, throw me to the floor. You knock me out. They just throw me to the floor. I shake it off and figure out where I am. But there's a red light in this scenario because we're it's on raw. And he picks me up as I say, "I you knocked me out. Where are we?" He goes going off the top rope. Stop me. So I took the you know the bump from the uh, from the slam. I'm pretty sure I remember it like that. And I had a way of knocking a guy up the ropes. I never really saw anybody else do. I would wait till he got his feet up on the ropes. And then I would just dive on the ropes, which of course would shake it. And he nut shots himself, gets a really good pop. So I still have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. So I just walk over and I hit him. And he goes, take me off the top. And I say, ah, right, suplex off the top. So I got him and I got you know, first rope, second rope. I go to put my foot on the third rope. We're normally I'm going to put both feet up there and we're going. But I thought I got to get this guy flat because I'm still on Queer Street at this point. I pick him up. He gives me his body. We come back. And when we hit, I hear him going, oh, I was so focused on him. If you watch back at that at that moment, I land on the back of my neck. I don't land flat. I land on the back of my neck and my feet jackknife. So my whole body, instead of bending forward, bends, you know, like forced into a shoulder stand, you know, jackknife. And I'm going, oh, and he's going, Oh, and I'm literally like, please, God, please, God, please, God. Because at that point, I'm just I'm feeling the tingling in my feet and my hands. And I'm like, oh, please, I'm moving my fingers. I start to roll side to side because all the rush through my head is I felt like I, I felt like I was paralyzed for an instant. It could have not been, but it hurt like a motherfucker. And he said to me, are you OK? I said, no, let's go home. So he's going to beat me on this, and then I'm going to catch him with a cutter and leave him laying. So we get that done. I point out to the crowd, and you can see me hold on to my neck because I feel like now this is my mobility. You know, like there's no mobility. And uh, we went to the back, and like anything, we, you know, and thank each other for the match and apologize where needed. And he said, I'm sorry I kicked you in the face like that. And I was like, hey, ain't checkers. He goes, but what I really thought I got you. He goes, I got you with that clothesline. 
He said, because you got me back, said, I thought I tore my bicep. So there's a jaw, his jaw, my jaw print is in his massive arm, right in his elbow spot. <laughs> and he goes, but you got me back. I go, what do you mean I got you back? He goes, when your feet came around on that jackknife, you hit me in the dick so hard, I thought my dick was on fire. And of course, everybody started laughing. But I knew right there I was fucked. You know, I knew it wasn't like when I'm back pain, it was different when I blew my back out. And I thought I was screwed there too, but I could turn that around. And But when I did this to the neck, when my same doctor who said my career was over when I blew my back out and broke my back and ruptured my L4 and L5, when I went back to him less than three months later and showed him what I could do, he said he'd never seen anyone come back like that from that injury. And he signed off on me going back to work. His name was Dr. Edwards. Well, now I'm showing him this injury. And I'm showing him the bump I took. And cause I got I got it filmed on my little camcorder because I would film everything I ever did. And I would hook it right up to the truck. So I had it. And he said, you are so lucky that you are not a quadriplegic. He goes, the odds of you not being one is only because you're so mobile. He said, but you're done. So that's where I decided to say, fuck it, I'm done. And the only reason I was able to come back and do TNA, because it wasn't 24, 27 days a month on the road. You know, it was five, you know, sometimes three. So, and I wanted to come back and show what I could still do because you know, I never liked, I liked working with Christian. That was a lot of fun. I love my WrestleMania match, but pretty much after day one in WWE, they kind of like killed the Diamond Dallas, not kind of, they killed the Diamond Dallas Page character. They didn't even want me doing the Diamond Cutter sign. You know, all the hard work that I put into everything, they wanted, you know, they did not want to see WCW in any way flourish. Because that, you know, is business. I mean, it wasn't, you know, in the beginning I took it personal, but at some point I realized this is just business. You know, it's like, okay, somehow you were lucky enough to beat us for 83 weeks, but you lost the war and we're beating you down. <laughs> so for me, you know, it wasn't, you know, once I really realized that, I realized it was just business. If it wasn't me, it would have been Sting or anybody who came there. And you look at, you know, 10 years, 20 years later, or 15 years later when Sting went there, he never beat anybody, but they gave him an unbelievable push, like really amazing, you know, push. And the two jobs that he did help, one helped, uh, um, you know, Rollins, which he was totally deserving of. And the other one was, you know, just Triple H and, you know, not that he needed to win or the loss, but, you know, Sting that looked like he was at the end of his career. And now look at him. <laughs> you know, he's doing amazing. And I don't know how the hell he's still doing it, to say the truth. I recently watched your, your podcast with Steve Austin on the Broken Skull Sessions. I'm not sure when that was filmed, but I liked the part where he was talking about uh, living with you. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what it was like living with Steve Austin? That would have made an amazing reality show. I wanted it to be a reality show too, but he was not into that. <laughs> she, she's a very private guy. He really is. Even though he's over the top as a character, that's Steve Austin amped up. But he's a very private cat. And... Uh, you know, he was out there looking to do the acting thing. Uh, but And he would have been incredibly successful. He would have been insanely in sex, uh, successful if he would have really wanted it. And at some point, he just didn't really want it. You know, he didn't. It was, it was, but he came out there and, he, you know, he gave it a shot. And he, he wasn't into, you know, it, it's easy for him to be Stone Cold Steve Austin. And Stone Cold Steve Austin is almost as over as he was fucking 25 years ago. 
he really probably is even, you know, if he's at a wrestling mat, he's even more over. And he proved that not this WrestleMania, but last one. But we had so much, you know, fun in the beginning of uh, us getting together. <laughs> uh, but it was like Oscar and Felix. And if you ever watch The Odd Couple, <laughs> I was the Felix character, which nobody would believe. Uh, but, you know, so it seems that was just, you know, good times hanging out. One of my favorite moments was when I decided to go back to wrestle with TNA. And I asked Rick Bassman if he would, because he had his own little UPW, Universal Power Wrestling, Professional Wrestling or something. Can't remember the name of it. But he had ran a lot of really good shows all over California and Vegas and stuff. And he had a group of guys who were training. And I said, can you send me over one of your boys? And just to pick me up so he can take me there. So I was looking for a place. And I'd like to work out with him for a little bit. So he sent me The Miz. And what a great kid, you know, bringing super personality like he does have. And uh, we, uh, you know, he picked me up. He told me about the real world and all that. And I was thinking, damn, you really do have a, you know, because they say that real world, real world is the first reality show, but really wrestling is the first reality show. <laughs> then it's the real world. And I thought, like, this guy's got the personality. And I didn't realize it at the time, you know, because you couldn't tell, but he had insane work ethic, too, like, to want to be as good as he could be. And we went there, and he let me, you know, bounce him around and take diamond cutters and just chain wrestle and stuff. And then at the end of it, I said, so what do you want to work on? He goes, what do you mean? I said, let's. I'll teach you. You know, it sounds like you got a real passion for the business. I said, let me show you some shit. He goes, absolutely. He couldn't believe I was doing it. And so for another half hour, I, you know, I showed him stuff and things I thought he could, you know, be better. Let me see how you do this or that. And, and that night he's dropping me off. And I said, now he has no idea I live with Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I said, why don't you come on in for a beer? He goes, oh, I'd love to. So he comes in, and who's on the porch but Steve and Kevin Nash. And I introduced him to this guy named The Miz. And uh, we all know how great Miz has done. <laughs> yeah, hosting WrestleMania this year and multiple-time world champion. Uh, you've worked with a lot of celebrities, Carl Malone, Jay Leno, Dennis Rodman. What's it like being in the ring with the with the part timers like that, who are big, huge stars that you really don't want to hurt when you're in there with? Well, you know, more than anything, it, like when I did it, when I did it with the tag team situation. You know, anytime you're in a tag situation, I don't care if everybody knows what they're doing. Sometimes they can still be rough because, um, you know, when it's four people out there or six, I mean, there's such so many things to remember, you know, um, that it's much harder. So now take two of those people and make them green as grass, like Rodman and Malone or um, Jay Leno and Eric Bischoff. <laughs> At least Eric had an idea of what was supposed to happen. But when you're out there and you're laying, like, Hulk was not a lay-everything-out guy. Uh, Macho was. I was. Hulk was a call-it-out-there guy. Well, next to impossible to call it out there, when these guys are just trying to figure out what the hell they're doing out there, you know, and how not to look bad. So there was a lot of pressure on me to make sure that that delivered. And I brought in Kidman, Canyon, and Eric Watts when I was on the road to help train those guys. And uh, I thought that when you take the match <clears throat> for what it was worth, I thought the Malone and Rodman one was about as well done as you could do one of those. Um, 
until you look at a guy like Stephen Emile, who, when I saw him go out there and had a match, I, th I think it was Christopher Daniels. I mean, Christopher is an unbelievable worker to begin with. But Stephen, I mean, like, wow. I mean, I, I didn't know it was him. I was like, who the hell is that guy out there? He's pretty good. Uh, but nobody is anything like Logan Paul. Like, holy fuck. Like, that kid has got to be one of the most gifted athletes, personalities ever. Because he got our business right away. Um, Carl was one of the greatest athletes I was ever been around. And Rodman both. And like I said, I thought they did a pretty damn good job. But there was a, you know, it was a big learning curve and I had to be the one to remember all of it. Cause Hulk was like, this is on you, D. <laughs> Thanks, Hulk. It's glad to be here with you. <laughs> you know? So where were we? Uh, yeah, well, you, you were mentioning you and Macho Man like to plan things out and, and all the, oh. Of all people, Bagwell just tried to call me. <laughs> So, so, uh, so everything's planned out now, but I just wanted to ask you about the, there was a rumor that the undertaker had some sort of issue with you liking to plan out matches, but wouldn't he have had to plan out matches as well back then? You know, I think there was a point in time and I, and me and Mark, so much was made of that. Like I really like Mark and, and I always felt that he really liked me as well. You know, I, I think that, because of just the feud and everything, it was kind of more overblown than any of that, you know? Um, but back then, a lot of guys, like when I started in 90, there was guys who developed spots, okay? And you could, if you worked with that person over and over again, those spots became really easy. You could call them out there. Like you take a match like, uh, Dusty and anybody, but Dusty and Funk or Flair or, or Rick and Steamboat, those guys wrestled a thousand times together. So they literally could call shit on the fly and it'd be unbelievable. You know what I mean? Um, and in and, and our scenario, coming up and learning, I always liked, like, wouldn't you rather know what I was going to do? And this way you could you know, be ready to react to that. You, we would miss a beat. But I didn't lay out every single thing. I laid out a whole blueprint. But in the middle was a bunch of improvisation. I used to call it preparation and improvisation. Um, but what was really interesting, Mach, man, he, he laid out everything. And everybody would bust my balls on it. Do you think anybody said anything to Macho? No. 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 But why were we the feud of the fucking year in 97? Because we knew exactly where we were going. We improvs where needed. But we knew the story we were trying to tell. And again, today, it's all laid out. It was interesting I found, because I've talked to Cody about this and a few others, a lot of guys don't talk in the ring, though. They rely on their memories, which is pretty fascinating when you think about it. But for me, even though I laid shit out out there, I go out there and I can call it all to you. So if you saw me moving, I never took the chance that you were going to remember. So I called out there as well. So you were ahead of your time in a way. And I do remember when Macho Man put that title on you, it looked like he was really proud of you. It looked like you guys had a real connection there. We really did, bro. I just told this story the other day. Uh, and I'll tell it on this right here. Thanksgiving, 1997. I remember... People had beepers back then, but what they really were were the, the beginning of texting, right? So I'm getting these texts on this beeper saying, thank you, bro. Really appreciate you. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. I helped at least 30 guys get jobs. 
at least. I hope guys who got who got let go get to come back. So everybody, and that was really from 95 on, because Bish was in a real spot of power then, and we were super tight. And I could bring him talent. Like one time, Canyon would tell me about this guy, Kidman. And I'm like, bro, I can't bring Bischoff another guy. I can't take him. I, you know, it's, he, everybody I've brought him, he's taken. But at some point, he's going to tell me, what the fuck are you doing? And he goes, just watch his finish. Just watch his finish. And he did that shooting star finish, right? No one, no one had ever seen that before. And I was like, whoa, that's amazing. So I hit the you know record uh, the push you know the eject button on the VHS player. I took the tape. Bischoff, who Dusty Rhodes' wife, Michelle Cody's mom, who sold us both the homes and Atlanta's so big, like she didn't really know the area, so I don't think she realized. I've never asked her this, but she never said Eric Bischoff's thinking about buying a house across the street. She never said that. So I'm thinking, like, maybe you just got, you know, Atlanta's just so big. You, you didn't realize you're in the same neighborhood. And uh, what ended up happening was uh, me and Bish bought homes across the street from each other from Michelle, which was awesome. Because Michelle, without Michelle, I don't have a career. Because she made sure when Dusty was doing the polka dotted thing in WWE that if I called, she'd make sure he called me back. I mean, she was an angel. And so it's, I'm so happy that she's gotten to see Cody have such an amazing run right now. But um, so I go down to Bishop's house and I take the, I, 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 he's watching a program. So I sit down, commercial comes on. He goes, what's up? I said, you want to see an amazing finish? He said, of course. I put it in the tape recorder, I hit play. He did He did it. He went. That's amazing. He goes. What's he doing? I said, looking for a job. He said, and, and the standard was four hundred bucks a week. You go down the power plant and you, you you sign a developmental deal. That's what it was. And next thing you know, the kid who's been dreaming to be a wrestler his whole life is in WCW. Today he's works in WWE, still in the office. And got a job probably for life because everybody loves him. Great, great kid. And you know, I'm getting so many people trying to call me today. So back to that story, I'm, I'm seeing everybody who's saying thank you. You know, it's Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And I'm thinking, man, who doesn't know I'm thankful? I have to fuck. I'll bet you Randy doesn't know. Like Dusty knew, Jake knew, Scott. Kev, Eric, I mean, all those guys who are my boys, because I always thank them. And I always, I, I didn't just thank them. I told people what they did for me, like I still do today. And with all those guys, it was very influential in my career. And so I pick up the phone and I call Randy. Of course, he never answers the phone. Leave a message. So I say, hey, Randy, it's going to sound kind of corny, but everybody's beeping me some messages on the beeper thanking me for helping them you know live the dream and i started thinking like who doesn't know i'm thankful and i thought you know i don't know if you know how thankful i am for giving me this opportunity bro i said it's not lost on me i want you to know it's not lost on me that i'm not living this life without you doing the favor you did for me. And I'll never forget it. And appreciate you, man. Have a great Thanksgiving. And I didn't think about it again. That was on a Wednesday. We'd already filmed Thursday's show for Thunder. So I didn't have to do anything there either. Or, or there was no Thunder. Either way, Monday, we walk, I walk into the building and you know, wherever we were in Ohio or wherever. And as I'm walking towards the locker room area, changing area, I catch Randy out of the corner of my eye. And before I can say anything, he goes, Diamond, get over here. I'm like, what the hell did I do? <laughs> I mean, it sounded like he was pissed. 
So as I'm walking up, I go, what's up? He grabs me by the arm and he pushes me in his office. He goes, I got your message. Yeah, I did. And I got to tell you, I listened to it. I listened to it a couple of times. Yeah, I did. I did. And then I called my dad and I played it for him. And I said, dad, did any of the boys ever do anything like this for you? He said, no, I want you to know it meant a lot. And he gave me a hug. He looked me off the ground. I thought I was, I thought I was gonna get a fist fight with him. And all he was doing was wanting to say thank you. And I, and I tell everybody when I, I, I lead that story into this, Booker T and I went to speak for Joe Clark the guy who did, they did the movie about Lean On Me, where, you know, the kids, it was such a drug-infested area that he'd walk around the high school with a baseball bat, the principal, and he chain-locked the door so the kids couldn't come or go until those chains were let go and they had supervision leaving so the drug dealers wouldn't, you know, be on them. Well, Joe, since then, was at this holding center. And these weren't for kids. You fuck up again, you're going to jail. This is from like the county prison, the holding center until they went to the big house. And they're all teenagers or early 20s. And Booker got up. I, I get up there and I do my shit. It's, it's, it's inspiring. Book went up there at a different level and told his story. And no one had heard it yet. Like, didn't hear about the, you know, the burglaries. You know, or the, the robbings of the seven eleven. No, I think they were Burger Kings or something. He didn't no one knew that story, how he had spent two years in prison and came out and turned his life around. And one of the things Book said, and I'll never forget it, he's trying to tell these young men, when you get out, because I got out. I did two years, I got out. You can change your life. And he said, Please and thank you cost nothing. I was like, wow, that's powerful. So me and Book get in the car and we're driving to the next town. And I'm like, Book, you got to tell that story, bro. I mean, oh my God, that is such a, I mean, I'm, I always had a lot of respect for you, man, but now it's like at a different level. And I've always felt that way about Booker. Uh, I consider him one of my really good buddies. He was here for my 60th birthday party. He flew in for it with his with Carm Charmel and, uh, you know, uh, great human being. But I just never forgot that. Like, please and thank you. It costs nothing. Very good advice. Uh, I know you have a bunch of projects. You're, you're going to England, as you discussed at the start. You have a reality show with, with Buff Bagwell involved in it, I understand. Do you want no, to... Uh, please correct you. Docu-series, because reality okay. shows are just bullshit. They try to put people against each other, try to create conflict. Mine is the antithesis of that. I'm trying to pull people together, like I always do, to get them to help them grow and learn and, you know help each other because when you help someone out you feel really good about yourself your self-esteem starts to come back and you you just feel better about yourself that's what's so amazing about my life this last especially last 12 years you know i've helped so many people but it, <laughs> i'm helping myself because it makes me feel good about me you know so really good like if I die, when I stand up, I have a heart attack and die. I'm not afraid to be my maker. I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to leave because I love being with my wife so much. I want to stay here. I want to live as long as I can, but I want to live healthy. I don't want to live beat up and crippled up. I don't want to live like that. That's not who I am. I want to live life to its fullest. But because of my karma, I don't feel that whole that a lot of people feel and anybody can feel this way if they just help somebody out and 
make it a part of their passion. Well, God bless you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for giving me the uh, the yoga program. It's great. I really recommend it to, to anyone out there to try. And I'll let you close this off uh, with whatever you want to tell the fans. You know, it's the only thing that really matters is that you believe in you. And that's why I've been able to do everything that you guys have seen me do. Like I'm building right now a DDP. Oh, it's called Pages Retreat. And it's going to be in Panama City Beach on the Gulf. So for you, those of you on the East Coast, the ocean. But it's called the Gulf. <laughs> and uh, going to have, it's going to be like a boutique hotel because I'll rent it out the bottom three floors. Top floor is mine and Pages. But I'm also going to do retreats there. And everything that I've been lucky enough to do involves helping other people. Just part of what I do. And again, makes me feel really good about me. That retreat is going to be a place that people can come. And, you know, instead of going to Mexico, like I'm doing in July for a week, I'll be able to do like, you know, we're five to 10 of them a year and it'll be more of an intimate deal. And I'm always thinking about what am I doing next? As opposed to most of my buddies who are 67, they're finally retired and enjoying their retirement. I can't ever imagine being retired. You know, I'm always going to be doing something that is in a positive, positive way. And I think if everybody starts to just take on a, a, a portion of that, It'll just, it'll, they'll just be in a better spot. Uh, if you have never seen your resurrection of Jake the Snake, it's on Amazon Prime. There's also another one we did there called Relentless. And that's a story of me blowing my back out to where we are today. Super transparent and super inspirational. So uh, check them out. Go check the program out. DDPyoga.com or DDPY.com. And you get seven days free on the app. Check it out. And you'll see what it's all about. Hannibal, always a pleasure. I'm going to set you up with Mr. Bagwell. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call him since so he just called me and uh, get you guys uh, on uh, get you guys on the podcast.